Well, good afternoon to those of you joining us on UK time and good morning to those joining from the US. A very warm welcome to you all and thank you for taking the time to join us for this event, which is about the challenges and opportunities for UK businesses in the US. I'm Georgie Collins. I'm a partner at Owen Mitchell and head our US desk. I've got a particular interest and focus on the transatlantic trade corridor, having spent a lot of my career helping and representing US businesses in their activities in the UK and supporting UK businesses expand their business and operations into the US. Before we get started and I introduce you to our panel, just a couple of housekeeping points. In relation to questions, thank you to those of you who have already submitted them. Um, you can submit additional questions throughout the session via the Q&A function on your screen. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the session. If we don't get to all of them, we will come back to you directly after the event. So do please include your name and email address and that will only come to us. It won't go to the whole of the group. We'll also be recording this virtual event and it will be sent out afterwards. So do feel to send that on to any colleagues you think may be interested. And lastly, towards the end of the session, we'll be posting a feedback link. If you can take just a couple of minutes to let us know your feedback, we'd be really grateful. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce you to our panel. We're in a steam company today, that's for sure. Emmanuel Adam. Emmanuel is an executive director and the director of policy and trade at British American Business. British American Business is the leading transatlantic trade association and is committed to strengthening the economic corridor between the US and the UK. Anne-Marie Martin. Anne-Marie is the director of global business networks at the British Chambers of Commerce. British Chambers of Commerce have been shaping the UK's business agenda for more than 160 years now, helping UK businesses grow and trade successfully across the world. John Dickerman. John heads the US office of the Confederation of British Industry and is based in Washington, DC. And Tara Nicholson. Tara is a specialist tax advisor at US based accountants with them. She specialises in advising clients from startups to billion dollar mature corporations. Our panel are going to offer their valuable insights into the challenges, opportunities, some commercial trends and best prospect sectors for our UK based businesses, whether choosing to do business in the US or expanding their operations into the US and also attracting investment from the US and what that might look like. So thank you to our panel for joining us and you will hear from them in a few minutes. A little background and context um, that shaped this event. Our recent UK powerhouse report in conjunction with the Centre for Economics and Business Research delivered a very clear message that attracting more foreign direct investment is vital for developing, developing the UK's infrastructure, creating job opportunities and raising productivity. Despite business activity being heavily impacted by COVID-19 and Brexit, our report forecasts that the UK is set to become the fourth most attractive destination for investment in the world. The US remains, by a very significant margin, the largest single source of FDI in the UK compared to any other country or bloc. Geographically, London is the largest recipient of FDI. Um, it's got about 34% of the projects where they're located. Interestingly, the North East saw the largest rise in foreign direct investment projects between 2018 to 2020, with 24% of projects being located there. And the West Midlands saw the most job creation as a result of foreign direct investment, with 157 projects being created and supporting just over six and a half thousand jobs. So it shows how important that foreign direct investment is. Various economic reports have shown that the UK US economic relationship has gained further prominence among UK exporters in the aftermath of the UK's departure from the EU and that there are very significant opportunities for UK businesses when they're choosing to do business in the US and or expanding their operations there. So let's get started with our panel. First of all, I'm going to turn to Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, can I ask you please to just set the scene and tell us what you're seeing from a UK economic perspective? I'll do my best, Georgie. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely to be with you all, uh, and particularly as the sun is shining in London today, which is super. Um, I'd love to be positive about this subject, uh, sort of a UK economic perspective, but um, sadly, there's 
quite a lot of clear evidence in our sort of from our regular research that indicates that we're fa facing a pretty challenging situation. I don't think this is any great news uh, to anyone. Um, there's been a, a seismic decline in business growth, of course, and in particular exports too, for, for very good reasons. This is a global phenomenon. It's not just a UK only issue. Uh, business, uh, but some of our research, it'd be good to just tell you a little bit about the facts and figures. So business conditions have remained historically poor in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, confidence was boosted due to the strong vaccine rollout, uh, inevitably, uh, and the government's roadmap, which provided some ability for companies to forward plan. And that's been obviously key to some decision making. On a cheerier side, though, uh, our most recent economic fall podcast, which was published in mid-June, has predicted that UK GDP growth for 2021 will be 6.8%, which is the strongest on record. Uh, the UK economy is then expected to return to its pre-pandemic level in Q1 2022. Don't hold me to this because the, there are so many moving parts at the moment, but relatively positive nevertheless. And with growth of 5.1% projected for next year. We also expect that consumer spending will be the main driver uh, of this year's economic rebound uh, and business investment is forecast to rebound strongly in both 2021 and 2022. To note, though, um, that our latest outlook projects an uneven recovery with some uncertainty, particularly around unemployment uh, and inflation rises as raw material costs rise uh, to record highs. Uh, and disruption, of course, the inevitable dis disruption from that in supply chains, uh, but particularly because of the ongoing post-Brexit and COVID challenges. Um, one would hope, though, that these challenges uh, are relatively transient as we move into recovery and hopefully a period of rebuilding our economy. Um, Clearly, trade, uh, we always say this, will be a key driver for economic recovery. Uh, this is not a new uh, syndrome, a new phenomenon. It's always been the driver uh, for economic growth. Uh, our historical trade deficit um, has always uh, stood against us or has done for some time. Uh, and there's really now scope to tackle this at a strategic level. So government, again, on a positive side, has given some positive indications around their priorities on trade, uh, with the ambition to establish the UK as a global player around services, digital and data, uh, access to an open, vibrant economy that welcomes and continues to successfully attract inward investment. We've done well historically in that space. Uh, and we can see a clear path towards that ambitious program uh, of forging independent trade relationships across the world. Um, then there's the whole opportunities piece to become a global leader around the green economy in particular, encouraging innovation and developing new technologies that will be in demand across the world. The USA, uh, again, this won't be new, uh, is our largest trading partner. It, it's not always well known, actually, um, in terms of it's, it's our largest trading partner, of course, other than the EU, but does sit ahead of both Germany and Ireland. And again, not many people necessarily realise that. Uh, so it's absolutely apt, um, Georgie, to be showcasing and highlighting the importance of the US a UK trade and investment relationship at this time. Thank you. Um, looking at UK businesses, can I, what's your perspective that makes us attractive and UK businesses from a foreign direct investment perspective? And, and do you have an insight where that sort of investment might be coming from? Uh, we're popular. <laughs> we, we are popular. But before I go into, I suppose, a little bit around what makes business, what, what it is it about UK businesses that make us attractive, I think it's quite important to first talk about the UK itself. Uh, and what it is about the UK that makes us attractive for, for many markets around the world. And we do tend to to attract investment globally. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that the UK has risen to be the fourth most attractive investment destination for foreign investors after the US, 
China and Germany ahead of us as well. Um, and that's according to a recent large survey of global business leaders. So businesses on the front line that, you know, those decision makers um, that are uh, they say that they're ranking the UK in their top three destinations. So that's very positive. Uh, clearly, economic uncertainty creates challenges, uh, but again, that is a global challenge, um, particularly at the moment. So it seems that what made the UK interesting before the pandemic continues to resonate around the world. So we have, I don't think, again, uh, this is not new. We have a strong rule of law, a liberal economy, a flexible uh, labour markets and a highly educated workforce. We are a, a, a big pool of talent in the UK. Uh, this makes us hugely competitive. Um, I think what international businesses value in the UK is, is that we are uh, an important part of the European and actually the global economy and continue to be so. Uh, we're admired for the liquidity and depth in our financial markets, the strength and openness of, uh, of that regulatory infrastructure in particular and the quality of our research and development capabilities. Um, many still see the UK as the gateway for international investment and a springboard for access to global markets. And I think there was a lot of discussion, wasn't there, leading up to the end of the transition period that talked about will the UK continue to hold that position? Uh, I think it probably has. We, the fruit will be, uh, you know, we will see that eventually uh, when we get to the, I suppose, the end of this current challenge that we're all faced with globally. I think the City of London, huge asset, um, but not only. Uh, and it's particularly considered to be a crucial um, asset for businesses, uh, and mainly because it offers a develop that the, the, what I've already mentioned that developed financial ecosystem, uh, and the accumulation of talent that that comes with that. Um, other cited inf incentives have been that sort of powerful advantage of English and the English law. Um, uh, it's the sort of seen to be the global lingua franca for business. Uh, and that facilitates access to um, capital and trade from around the world, uh, well-established R&D capacity in the UK uh, in key sectors like life sciences, technology, uh, financial and professional services. Um, and also, by the way, I think it's also important to note the British companies are considered to be some of the, again, maybe not well known or thought about, but some of the most exciting and innovative in the world. Uh, and of course, Brand Britain is still cited as being hugely strong. It's had a bit of a bashing recently, but according to our network, global network of British chambers around the world, it apparently we we still have a very strong brand uh, and it's highly recognized and very popular. And there's the whole practical aspects, which perhaps someone else will go into a little bit later around the ease of doing business in the UK. You know, we're, we're ranked somewhere. I think it's the eighth in the World Bank's 2020 doing business guide. Uh, setting up in the in the UK is probably one of the fastest in Europe uh, as a company. So all of those are big indicators that ranks us uh, as con continuing to be competitive and attractive. Brilliant, thank you. Taking a, a slightly different tack now, what about the um, the FTA? What do you think about that in terms of its importance for UK businesses and transatlantic trade? Uh, it, it's not my uh, area of expertise, and I think there are probably people on the panel that are more uh, expert at being able to respond to some of this. But let me give you a few insights, I suppose, from, from what we're seeing. So clearly trade with the US accounts for something like 20% of our UK export, 12% of imports. That's according to 2019 figures. So that may be slightly skewed, obviously, in the last year or so. Um, we it, it is one of the top UK's top three trade markets, as we've spoken about before, you know, alongside the EU and China. Um, Therefore, I suppose, put, you know, putting that trade on a preferential lower tariff basis, uh, along with the potential provisions on digital trade, SMEs, conformity assessment services and labour mobility could really create new export opportunities for UK businesses. We do we do a huge amount together already. So with that as an enabler, we can do even more. Um, 
We would hope that a free trade agreement with the US, though, can be reached alongside a deepening uh, relationship in UK trading relationship with the EU. I think we can't forget about that. Uh, it's not uh, one or the other. It's it's everything. Um, it won't be without its challenges. That's absolutely for sure. Uh, one of I think from speaking to companies, one of the most cited barriers I often hear about is this whole area of divergence in standards and the different requirements the companies would need to meet in order to comply on uh, comply in terms of supply to the U.S on one side and then the EU on the other. So a lot needs to be sorted out there. Um, at the end of the day, though, I think it's really worth me saying is that I, I am a huge fan of FTAs, of course. They're huge enablers, really great enablers, but actually it's still about people. They are, it's people that do business with people. And the importance of building that global network uh, of known, trusted, expert business partners uh, and connections is the key to doing the deal. It's looking about looking at each other in the eye, deciding whether you're suited, you like each other, you want to do business together, uh, whether you have the right offer that's going to be paramount. And actually, from my experience in some in my previous incarnations in quite challenging markets, developing and emerging economies around the world, uh, particularly in places like sort of Southeast Europe and, and Central and Eastern Europe in my past, I know that people did business irrespective of the barriers and, and trade agreements. They just, if it was if it was the right product, right service, and you had the right relationship in place, then business gets done. Thank you. Um, so moving sort of into a more sort of optimistic, I know you started off at the beginning having a degree of pessimism and then having some slight reasons to be cheerier. Um, do you, I mean, do you, do the British Chambers feel optimistic about the opportunities for UK businesses in the US and attracting this foreign direct investment? Uh, yes, mostly, <laughs> but actually, definitely. Uh, I hesitated because of some of the barriers and challenges that I have mentioned. And I do actually what really does worry me sometimes is timing. I think timing is crucial. Uh, we hear about and witness firsthand um, how businesses are still firefighting, trying to get through the ravages of the pandemic. So learning to live with a new training and, and this whole thing about learning to live with a new trading relationship with, let's face it, hitherto our largest trading partner, you know, the EU. And I think there's been the challenges around inflation, high costs, uh, shortages in supply chains. Uh, you know, these these have created some some problems. Um, but I've also in, I have to say on a really positive note, I've, I've witnessed the most incredible innovate, innovative and creative and entrepreneurial drive coming to the forefront, particularly in the last 15, 18 months. Uh, companies are pivoting and actually not just for the moment and not just to respond to a new need, but actually for the long term, like any challenge, you never waste a challenge or you, you never miss the opportunity of a challenge in the sense that it's always a really good point where you can review and restructure what you're doing so that you're more resilient and sustainable in the future. Uh, I think, you know, our research in the past has shown that internationally active firms while significantly impacted by you know the challenges around us, have somewhat have been somewhat uh, uh, likely to report increased investment and cash flow actually. And in the past, you know they've been seen to be uh, much more responsive and agile around developing new products, services, production methods um, than non-internationally active firms. So I think. There's some really good stories to tell there. And as we start developing our new relationship, trading relationships across the world, of course, businesses will need support to be able to rise to those challenges and to, and to you know, grasp the opportunities. But I'm a firm believer that actually working in partnership around the world to bring all of that together into one space uh, is incredibly important for future well-being of businesses. And I think we are on that trajectory already. So hopefully that wasn't too negative. <laughs> I hope I managed to give some positivity <laughs> to this. Yes, I think that's that's given me reasons to be optimistic and, <laughs> and, and, and hopefully our audience too. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. My pleasure. Um,
I'm going to pass to um, and bring Emmanuel in now. Um, Emmanuel, um, what do you see as the current state of play for transatlantic trade and investment? What's the horizon for you? Well, thank you so much, Georgie, for having me. Um, good to be on this panel. Good to see a lot of people that I'm familiar with. We obviously enjoy very much working with Elvin Mitchell. And today's to topic is obviously very close to my heart. Um, to respond to your question, let me follow Anne-Marie's example and start with a couple of facts and figures, even though I don't really think that they are that important. But I think it's good, good to point out that pre-pandemic, the transatlantic relationship in trade and investment has actually reached uh, an unprecedented level of success. Um, you know, there is this one expression that is often being used by um, political, political representatives and even representatives from uh, trade associations or businesses that just, you know, every day a million people will wake up and go to work for an American company in the UK or for a British company in the US. And the truth is it's actually 1.7 million now. So that means that we have seen over the past few years since that phrase made its first appearance, and I think I rem remember it was around 2013, 14, you've almost doubled the number of people directly employed by British companies um, that are invested in the US and US companies that are invested in the UK. Um, I just I just got a question whether I'm 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 visible. I hope that is now the case. I know there was a technical glitch, but I'm now hopefully visible. So that just gives you a little bit of a, a starting point. Now looking at more recent numbers, we have obviously seen and and Anne Marie mentioned that a drop in uh, in, in the figures. Um, now you know you have to be careful with some of the numbers, but when you compare some of the official numbers that came out from the um, official services in the US and in the UK, you could argue that there has been a drop of around 20% in, in trade and, and a similar amount of drop in, in, in cross-Atlantic investment. And that is quite significant when you just look at it within one year, you've just dropped almost 20% down. Um, so, and that was obviously because of the pandemic. So I may jump a little bit actually, because I wanted to add one thing that Despite that, um, we at British American Business have actually seen an astonishing continuation of activity among British companies, which I want to focus on here because that's the topic of today's conversation. British companies trying to continue with their exporting and investment journey, despite um, the fact that um, we were mostly at home and the transatlantic corridor was closed and, and we had to prioritize many, many other things than actually um, our business in some cases, meaning employees, you know, your own families and so forth. Um, and, and how do we know this? Because we have actually seen an increase in activity, activity in our um, uh, tracker systems that we have where we track investments, but also companies who got in touch with us trying to navigate a new, a new, new environment vis-a-vis -vis the US. And that is quite, quite uh, impressive and very astonishing. And I think companies have been able to do this because they embraced the new environment through um, adapting to a digital world, obviously. We do this today here too, but also by adapting their products and services sometimes in a very um, quite creative way. And, and maybe a final final point to, to finish on that. Um, just to give you a few names, you know, I think one of the bigger, biggest names has been Arrival, a UK company, Electric Cars. Uh, during the pandemic, moved it, uh, built a European, uh, an US headquarter in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is now building a manufacturing site to service UPS with a fantastic electric uh, delivery car. And then you had companies from across the UK, Macribur from Lockerbie, uh, Nesset from Newcastle, um, Smart, I mean, the Gymshark, you know, many of you will be familiar with Gymshark, um, who have continued their activities throughout the pandemic. And I found that really impressive. Um, final point, really on that question, uh, Georgie, and I may have actually added a couple of things um, that you may have asked otherwise. Anyway, um, Anne-Marie already said that. I echo some of her comments that she made. Our initial evidence right now, even though we are still at the, at the early stage, points into the direction that companies who were internationally active, and you know, this has always been a big topic for the UK, getting more people into the international space, I feel have done better than companies who didn't. Obviously, other factors play a role too, but um, looking at the companies that we work with, um, we actually haven't seen a company that that said, you know, we, we go bust or we just really struggle, we have to let everyone go. Um, most of them uh, did fairly okay and either fully embraced the new environment or at least strong enough to withstand the challenge, challenges until, until they are over. 
Wow, thanks, Manuel. That's um, that's positive um, and interesting. Certainly, in relation when you talk to that increase in activity. Um, in terms of that and what you're seeing of the of the activity, are there any particular trends coming out of that in terms of, you know, heightened activity across particular type of sector, types of products, or you know, is it mixed? So let me let me maybe combine combine that question with a couple of things that uh, I hope that would be able to say on you know what do we see going forward now because um, I think that that sits 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 together. Um, there are at least three points worth mentioning. Um, the trend is definitely that the U.S. in a way is more on British companies' radar than ever before. It's always been a key market. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the last time I checked, it's now a little while ago, the US is the single most important destination for exports uh, for all UK region and nations um, as a single. If you take the EU, then the EU as a whole would be bigger, but as a single destination, it would be the US. Um, and I would argue that the US, especially in the context of the UK leaving the EU, is much more on the radar than it has ever been before. Um, and that I would mention at the moment has also something to do that it's much more in uh, part of conversations. I mean, in that event is a, is a, is a perfect example of that, um, whether it be in the uh, NGO sector, private sector or in government. So much more on, on radar. Um, second, um, you have growth areas in, in, in at least two directions. You have the traditional, in quotes, traditional direction. So you still have, you know, um, uh, an IT, IT company that, um, or some of the companies that I just mentioned, uh, Smart um, or Nested auditing provider, Smart as a retirement technology business, a service provider who go to the US because they serve existing clients and they want to have people on the ground and serve them better. So there's a traditional route of you know why companies would go to the US. But then of course you also have now this amazing emphasis on green and new technologies, um, a specific emphasis on um, technologies indeed in the green space. And now Rival, I think, is a good good example, or the company that I mentioned in the beginning, MacRibor, I hope I pronounce it correctly, a plastics company that actually does um, uh, surfaces for, for roads uh, using recycled plastics. So, and I think that these companies um, I have a, have a specific, a special standing right now because the U US is focusing so much on green uh, technologies, green innovations, and is trying to encourage companies to bring these innovations to the US. And uh, just a quick heads up, we know that the US Embassy in London, the commercial service there, is currently working on a larger event between the 22nd and 23rd of September that focuses indeed on you know, what are the opportunities uh, around green tech, green innovation for UK companies in the, in the US market. And then one final, final point on that question. Um, I would argue that the infrastructure on trade is um, much better. So um, this morning I, I had the chance to speak to Director General Andrew Mitchell from the DIT responsible for exports and uh, and trade. And one of the things that we looked at was that the UK, not only in the context of the UK leaving the EU, has done a remarkable job in really building, rebuilding maybe even, uh, an infrastructure that is meant to support companies on their journey. And that comes, of course, with the objectives to get more companies exporting and so forth. But what, what's important here that something has happened and uh, I won't go into much detail, but um, there is a trade advisor uh, system currently bu being built up um, across the country. Um, British Chambers, um, CBI or, or British American Business would be uh, would know about it and would, would be in charge of making sure that people find that information and that I feel that system works quite well and is quite innovative. Um, so if you compare that to the landscape 10 years ago, I would say that there's a, a significant difference. So three points. Um, we uh, have more, the US being more on radar for UK companies. Um, we have traditional routes of growth, but also new routes of growth. And I feel the infrastructure is better. Thanks. I think you have wrapped up the, the question I was going to ask you about the has the landscape changed? Is the outlook better? And I think what you're saying is that it has changed in some ways and actually, you know, the outlook is good um, in terms of what you're seeing. Um, what advice would you give to UK businesses 
um, to, to help shape their expansion journey into the into the US? What nuggets have you got for them? Yeah, that's 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 a good question, and probably one of the more difficult ones, um, because obviously there's lots of advice that you can give. And uh, I, I would say that um, I'm sure a number of, of colleagues on this on the on this call uh, would probably echo the feeling that if you, for example, go online and you try to just to find information about how you expand into a different market, uh, you may feel quite overwhelmed by a the wealth of information that's out there, but also by the um, how non-specific it can be sometimes. You know, you read about how great the U.S. is, but that doesn't necessarily tell you how you can make it work. Um, so, and you have to dig much deeper in order to get the tangible information. So, um, I think the 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 advice I would give is uh, is reflected in in what we are currently trying at British American Business. Um, we are trying to ask the right questions um, to help companies map out their individual expansion journey. So the answer actually to your question is, ask yourself the right question. Um, I don't want to go through everything that we are currently working on that we have built, um, but um, I think you could probably nail down most of what exists out there into a small set of questions. And then based on the answer, you can decide, you know, when do I speak to the British Chamber? When do I speak to Urban Mitchell? When do I speak to the US government or the UK government? Um, what is it actually that, that I need? Um, uh, let me conclude with two examples. It makes a huge difference, uh, three examples maybe, a huge difference whether you um, are a service provider or if you have a good that you want to bring into a new market. Big difference and it will pretty much go like this. You know, Once you, have to, you know what it is and you should know, then the way is either this way or the other way. Same is true for, are you an exporter or an investor or both? Um, if you're an exporter, that, that your route will go one way, and if you're an investor, it will go the other way. And, and all of these support systems may be quite different than the ones that would apply that if you were, in this case, you know, an exporter, not an investor. And third, third example, location. You know, if, uh, oh my gosh, I mean, how often, how often do I hear, you know, US is big and you need to find a good cluster and, and uh, make sure that you're in the right market. But the US is massive indeed, so it's quite difficult to actually make a good choice. And But then a question that you could ask yourself is indeed, you know, okay, what product do I have? Um, where is the specific market for that? Give you one example here. Um, a small company um, that does little metal plates for um, pet gravestones. Um, so, and they looked into the US and they pretty much decided um, going into a specific market based on the number of pet owners in a specific state. And here we go. And so you can decide you know, based on that. Um, they didn't make the decision based on the number of pet gravestone metal plate uh, producers who sit in that, uh, that specific market. They really made it based on where do, does their audience sit. If you're really lucky, lucky, then you have an anchor client already from the UK that you can just use to expand into the US. But I will finish here. Just my answer is ask yourself the right questions. And again, we as British American Business try to ask those and help you find uh, a good responses to those then. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. Great, great advice and an interesting and novel example. I wasn't expecting but It's Texas, by the way, Texas, uh, Texas, huge uh, pet ownership and uh, growing population. So the more people, the more pets, the more uh, pet gravestones. I've learned something new. Thank you. When you um, so you you mentioned location. I'm going to move over to John now. Um, so, John, are you sort of seeing any particular geographical what I call hotspots um, which are attractive for UK businesses, and uh, and what is it that might make them attractive? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Georgie, for having me here today. Um, let me say how pleased I am to be here, and it's a privilege to be able to work with you and the excellent panelists that you brought together. What a tremendous example by by Emmanuel there. Uh, I never would have thought pet gravestones would have come up in a conversation like this, but it really does go to show you how diverse some of the uh, some of the, the the groups that we work with are and uh, what their specific needs are. So, many thanks also to those of you who are uh, who are tuning into our discussion this afternoon. 
It's a good question you've posed, though, and one I, I think that clearly goes beyond just geography and delves into the diversity of markets here in the US. And I want to talk about the diversity and challenges that they present a bit later, but with respect to the question at hand, there are absolutely areas that make sense for UK businesses to focus on or prioritize here in the US. When we talk to the uninitiated in particular who are looking to invest in the US, their first inclination is always to focus on a few primary landing spots like New York and California and Chicago. And all of these areas are hugely attractive um, and they have hugely attractive local and state incentives that could be beneficial from a tax or an employment perspective. But the reality of course is that the competition in those markets is also massive. As such, some of the secondary cities and regions in the US make a lot of sense to focus on. It's unfair to call them secondary cities when you consider the relative size of the economies we're talking about. Um, we're talking about places like Atlanta, and Denver, Seattle, Minneapolis, Austin, Texas, uh, and areas of North Car Carolina like uh, Charlotte and the Research Triangle and Raleigh-Durham. These are big growing economies. And what makes them so exciting, particularly to British investment, is that there's diversity in these economies. Now, certainly professional services is primary in each of these markets. Uh, I mean, th that, that's the area that we're going to be focusing on um, in, a, in a huge, uh, in, in a huge, uh, to a huge degree, I should say, uh, because that's where a, a huge amount of the trade between the US and the UK occurs. But each of these places also individually has done a great job of diversifying their economy away from one industry that might have dominated in the past. Take aircraft in Seattle, for example, or oil in Denver. I think the second point that's that's key in, in these areas is that there's a skillful workforce in these areas because, first of all, great universities in those areas, but they're also really desirable places to live. Um, they're more affordable than some of the bigger cities in the US. Uh, quality of life is, is, is important in some of these areas. Good health care. Um, so all of those things that you think about when you're trying to set up a family are equally important, I think, when you're trying to set up a business. And finally, I think the, the important point in, in some of these areas is uh, looking at it from a logistical perspective, these are areas that are easy to get to and easy to go to places from. They all have direct contacts and connections with the with the UK, which is hugely important. But in addition to that, they're either in the center of the country or they have great access to the highways or railroads or or other airports. So I think those would be the key areas that we would say you should focus on. Now, granted, uh, like Emmanuel said, you're going to have to do some really specific uh, intelligence and research in, into what it is you're looking to invest in and where you're looking to uh, where you're looking to grow. Um, but these are some areas that we found to be particularly exciting for, for UK businesses that are looking at the US. Thank you. And just then extrapolating from those sort of geographies that, that, that you've highlighted, um, overlaying that with a sort of sector lens, are, are you seeing sort of best prospect type sectors in the US for UK businesses that you're seeing grow or, you know, are, are really showing opportunity? Yeah, it's a really difficult question. And I think precisely because of, of the point I made previously about the diversity of economies and investment, Anne-Marie and, and Emmanuel have already made this point quite eloquently. Um, you look at, at UK investment in the US, it's already world leading. The US and the UK share the largest bilateral trading relationship in the world, and British investment creates and sustains more than a million jobs, as Emmanuel pointed out, in the US with investments in all 50 states and virtually every industry. But if you look at both what the UK is great at and what the US needs, I'd say professional services, still a massive opportunity for the UK investors, financial services and fintech particularly intriguing, but there are areas of opportunity in insurance as well. Um, services is one area where we're particularly fo focusing our lobbying efforts here in the US. We know that a trade deal between our two countries would be beneficial, but liberalizing areas like travel for professional services and mutual recognition of professional qualifications in areas like engineering, for example, could have a substantial tangible impact on investment outside the framework of that FTA. Infrastructure is another key opportunity. Our infrastructure here in the US is badly in need of investment. It's a priority for the Biden administration as well. And UK firms have expertise that isn't just isn't as pervasive in the US as, as it must be. Um, so there are some real opportunities there in construction, road building, bridge building, uh, renovating airports or building airports in the US. 
um, that could actually make some of this uh, infrastructure investment work in a way that that perhaps it, it wouldn't otherwise. I think public-private partnerships are very intriguing as well. Um, Canada has been particularly innovative working on PPPs uh, when it comes to infrastructure investment. The UK could really be a world leader here and, and a leader here in the US on PPPs. And we're also really eager to see expanded opportunities for SMEs. The UK is a great in incubator for SMEs and there's real need in areas like information technology, AI, green tech. And what we need to do is actually not only expand opportunities for SMEs, but explain to them how they can use the existing opportunities around some of the trade networks that, that are already there. Um, because SMEs want to export. They oftentimes just don't have the, the, the time or, or, or the ability to do so because of the because of the, the the number of people it actually takes to make something like that successful. The final area I think is it's important is uh, green growth. There's an expanding market for green technology in the US. The US is probably behind Europe here, uh, but this administration in particular is keenly interested in promoting green growth and hugely focused on the role climate change plays in trade. Thanks. Yeah, the green growth, I've, I've heard that come from all three of you so far. That's been a something that's that's permeated each of your comments and narratives so far. Pick that up at the end. Um, just looking to, to, to the other side in terms of looked at opportunity, what sort of challenges are you seeing on the ground for UK businesses? I mean, you, some of that we've, uh, has come out when you've talked about, you know, where you're looking to set up in terms of, you know, look at place, you know, ease of getting to, um, all that kind of thing. But are there other specific challenges that UK businesses are, are sort of facing coming to the US? Yeah, I hope I don't reiterate too too much of what Emmanuel already said quite well earlier in the conversation. But it is key to think about where you need to be in the US. And I think that will always be the biggest challenge. And that's where having a really solid team of service providers will actually be useful to you. Lawyers and accountants, they make a huge difference in determining what's going to be most beneficial to you. I mean, I think remember, the US isn't one market, it's 56 distinct markets. And it sounds like such a simple observation, but oftentimes businesses are caught unaware of the huge distinctions between federal law and state law. I think take insurance regulation, for example. Insurance is regulated at the state level in the US, so rules are different in each jurisdiction or tax, which I know Tara will, will be much more articulate on than I possibly can. We have to consider federal, state, and local tax obligations. So it's really important to have the right advisors to guide your business. But figuring out where you need to be, uh, I think is, is hugely important because you can't just look at the US as one market you'd like to conquer. You really do have to think of it as 56 different markets. I mean, granted, you may not be interested in investing in American Samoa, but, but at the same time, it's a wonderful place and I would encourage you to look at it. I think the second challenge is protectionism. Um, we're seeing increased protectionism and nationalism throughout the world. And while some of that rhetoric in the US is eased with the transition from Trump to Biden, there are still what we would consider abusive tariffs on imports into the US in an effort to protect the US steel and aluminum industry, for example. So protectionism is going to continue to be a, a, a key area that you need to focus on, particularly if you're focused on investment in the procurement markets. They're by American clauses at the federal level, but also at the state level, which greatly hinder the ability of, of UK businesses to invest in areas like infrastructure um, and service uh, provision to the federal government or the state and local governments. Um, so protectionism is really important as well, really, really a challenge. The third challenge when it comes to investment in the US is clearly China. And the US has a very, very clear position on, on China. And if you as a country aren't with the US, then you're very much against them. So I think you also need to be thinking about what your ambition towards investment in the East is going to look like when you're looking at the US. Um, how, are you gonna, how are you going to balance what you'd like to do in China, for example, with what you'd like to do in the US? There are really specific national security concerns in the US that you have to be aware of. Again, I think another reason why it's helpful to have a team of, of attorneys that can help you actually provide uh, and provide the resources you need. CFIUS is something that I talk about a lot, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, and it's something I think a lot of British businesses, unless they're uh, really sophisticated in investing in the US, don't really think about. But it's been expanded over the last couple of years. 
Areas like FIRMA have been expanded over the last couple of years. These are, these are regulations that deal with how foreign companies can invest in the United States. And you need to be aware of those and you need to be very clear about you know, who's coming to the US for what purpose out of the country, uh, where they've been in the past. If you've been in Iran in the past 10 years, you can't come to the US on an ESTA. You have to have a 10 year US visa to get into the country. Um, so I think areas like that are incredibly important. So I mean, my biggest piece of advice is have the best advisors that you possibly can. Thanks, John. They're, um, they're great practical insights. The sort of where do you need to be um, is often not the question which uh, businesses ask themselves first. Um, they've often, you know, sort of one of the things that we see is they, they've decided on a particular geography where they're going to incorporate themselves and set up and bringing in the, the brilliant example that Emmanuel gave of, you know, uh, the, the sort of pet cemetery actually focusing on where your you know key customer base is an audience I mean that was where they needed to be that's a really stark example that brings that alive um thank you for those tips John um I'm sure that can be I good. just can I just say rather cheekily I'm really really pleased to hear that that pet cemetery example was not in Maine for any of you who have read Stephen King in the past thank you I think it's important to draw that out absolutely <laughs> Tara, I'm going to come on to you now, if I may. Um, and if we can just kick off, having heard, you know, you've heard Anne Marie, Emmanuel, and John, and are you seeing some of the similar trends and opportunities, particularly with your clients and your day to day practice as, as, as they've talked to? Share your experiences with us. Sure, absolutely. Um, first, you know, thank you, like everyone else, uh, thrilled to have any opportunity to partner with the UK. Uh, I'd like to echo what Anne Marie uh, said in that the UK and US are very well suited to do even more great things together, and I'm very optimistic about the future. <clears throat> uh, to Emmanuel's point, we have also seen a lot of non US owned companies considering and even setting up manufacturing sites locally here in the US. Uh, to counter some of the logistic challenges that were exacerbated by the pandemic, uh, which is you know, exciting to, to hear. Uh, we also expect a lot more attention in the environmental, social and governance um, or ESG space and believe that this will be increasingly a way to attract not only investment, but also in attracting top talent from the labor market. The pandemic is believed to have contributed to a real value shift in some of the hearts and minds of, of people. And in order to be successful, companies will need to be aware of this. Um, as John referenced also, the US is made up of 50 states, which in addition to the federal level considerations, all 50 states operate as 50 different countries. And so certainly when it comes to federal level considerations, um, you know, you have to think about the states and the cities as well. So not to scare anyone away, um, it's certainly still a great uh, place to be, but there's just a lot of things to look out for. And so hopefully, um, you know, at the conclusion of this seminar, you know, everyone feels a little bit more informed. Um, finally, from a U.S. perspective, second quarter um, U.S. GDP year over year is expected to be at 10 percent as the economy here recovers from the pandemic. Savings rates in the US uh, is currently over 12% and there is over $4 trillion US dollars in money markets. So this money will be looking for investment and spending opportunities. Um, currently monetary and fiscal stimulus uh, in the US should keep the expansion uh, in place well into 2023. That's exciting prospects. Um, and and really good cause to be to, to be optimistic in terms of those opportunities. What do you what what are the challenges that you see for UK businesses in the US aside from you know in particular some of the things that Emmanuel and John have, 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 have sort of set out? I mean, do you see, are there particular states where it's easier to set up? For example, it's more challenging than others. You know, are there states where they've got more an advantage for, uh, you know, UK business coming in to, to set up or expand? 
Certainly, um, you know, the first and foremost of what we would really suggest, you know, when coming into the US, and this is where we see some of, you know, our clients and other companies getting into a bit of trouble is um, not good record keeping. So, you know, we would suggest, you know, just first and foremost, um, one of the, the best steps from a from a tax planning perspective would be great record keeping. Um, you know, some problems and traps, uh, or I like to say opportunities to get things right. Uh, there are certain considerations. Um, so securing a qualified uh, tax advisor, you know, familiar with multinational as well as multi-state uh, business issues. We've spent a lot of time helping companies manage unnecessary tax penalties that far exceed even just their regular corporate tax liability. So um, in the US, there are penalties that can be assessed for failure to report certain information. So even if a company is not profitable and doesn't have an income tax liability, there's there can be significant penalties that take time to clear up. Um, the US tax authorities are very keen to have all of this information on um, non-US owners, non-US subsidiaries, even non-US bank accounts. Um, we expect audits and notices to increase um, as the IRS, which is the US Federal Tax Authority, has recently announced that they um, intend to start to replace the nearly 17,000 auditors that, they, that were lost over the last decade, whether it was due to budget cuts or just um, you know, general attrition from retirement. So when looking at particular challenges, um, you know, one of the things that we suggest first and foremost would be looking at the choice of entity. So to reduce risks associated with, you know, things like permanent establishment, which would pull the non-US entity into the US income tax regime, that could happen from a federal standpoint, as well as all the local state jurisdictions. So a lot of states are moving towards combined or worldwide reporting. So there's some important elections, you know, to think about um, ahead of time, even if um, it, not in all cases would it increase the tax liability of the company to pull in, you know, those global entities. Um, maybe there's certain exclusions that they might qualify for. It's still um, a really um, large administrative burden. Um, you know, for, for companies to pull all that data just to put it on a U.S. tax return, and many wouldn't want to disclose that. So, you know, again, making sure that you have some good tax advice up front. Um, uh, also, on choice of entity, uh, when coming into the U.S., if the business in the U.S. will also hold real estate, uh, carefully consider what's called the FERPTA rules. Uh, and whether the real estate should be in a separate entity from the business operation. Just some simple things like that, you know, uh, ahead of time can really save some headaches. Um, so next, you'd want to consider the formation under state law, which um, there's, there are two different things here. There's the state of incorporation or formation, but then there's also the states where the company does business. And that could be totally different states and cities, which is where the company will actually be subject to income tax. So this, you know, again, comes with some administrative is issues, but record keeping is important. Once the entity is, is formed under state law, um, the company will need to get a tax identification number that'll be need to be applied for. You need a name of the US company, the address, which if at all possible, we really highly suggest getting a US address um, instead of a foreign mailing address. We, we see that um, cause a lot of issues, especially today, um, you know, it was only um, increased by the pandemic was the mail, the problems with the US mail, but it takes the tax authorities a lot of time to get the mail out through their own internal offices. And then if it has to go over oceans, I mean, it can be six weeks to, or, or even longer um, before our clients get the mail. And by that time, it's you know very difficult to unwind penalties. Um, so use a US address if at all possible for a, comp for a newly formed company in the US. Um, the other thing, um, most payments, you know, this is, where we see companies um, have a lot of administrative headaches too, is most tax payments now need to be made electronically. So companies, again, you know, not just 
need to have a US app mailing address. Um, we suggest also a US bank account um, and then also setting up these separate registrations in all the states where they're doing business. Um, keeping those registrations up to date. It's usually an annual filing, um, registering on time to make payments. All of this stuff takes time to get back via mail, um, but you want to have it in place when those payments are due. Um, OK, so so next, um, you know, the other place where we see some challenges uh, for for maybe startups in the US um, with non US owners. Um, it's in, important to have a responsible person to tackle the bookkeeping uh, and accounting records, even if that trial balance seems very basic from the beginning. Um, you know, we've seen some challenges with there not being someone responsible for keeping the US books um, and that can can pose some some challenges down the road. Um, the other thing to think about is, you know, when setting up in the US is the the best capital structure and what's optimal from a business and a tax standpoint. Uh, there have been a lot of changes to the amount of interest expense that companies can deduct in the US, not just with related party debt, um, but and also when the loans are with a non US related party. So even just with a third party bank, um, there's now restrictions. Um, there's also restrictions, you know, for when on the timing of interest being expensed for tax. And additionally, uh, some tax regulations were issued a few years ago requiring a lot more documentation, but delayed by the previous administration as being too burdensome on companies. One of the takeaways for us, you know, as tax advisors, uh, is that if there is going to be some type of debt, that the debtor have the actual ability to service the debt, um, or the tax authorities could recast it as equity anyway. Um, so, you know, the takeaway here is if, if funding the, the US operation is structured as debt, you want to be in close contact with both your UK and your US um, advisors on how, you know, things would be treated on both sides. There can be additional reporting, even withholding tax. Um, so this transitions well into this next topic when setting up in the US uh, is transfer pricing. It's a it's a broad term uh, to apply to the actual pricing at arm's length on related party transactions, but also the documentation. Um, the US has certain documentation requirements that must be completed to the filing of the tax return. Um, so if if a US company is audited um, that if it's a multinational operation, if there's related party transactions, one of the first things requested is this contemporary contemporaneous documentation. Um, you know, just to, to show the, that the pricing is all at arm's length. Um, this, you know, examples can be purchases or sales of goods, um, use of IP, access to management or IT or HR departments, interest, um, a host of other things. Um, so this is another area that companies with cross-border related party transactions will want to be in front of, or you can quickly run afoul of taxes in um, more than one jurisdiction. Uh, next is, um, you know, multi-state issues. We could spend a lot more time on this, this but just broadly, um, this includes state and local income or capital-based taxes. So um, in, the, in the US, um, there's a host of taxes that, that a company can be liable for, even if they're not profitable, um, such as sales and use tax, uh, taxes on gross receipts, um, and even personal property taxes like inventory. So as for certain states that are more difficult than others, we certainly um, you know, regularly see California, New York and New Jersey uh, as regularly making the list as very high tax states. Uh, we also are seeing a lot of our um, you know, US resident individuals you know, migrating to um, different areas of the country, uh, such as Florida, um, as just being a lot more uh, tax friendly um, for for businesses. Um, I mean, all of those states have very high lo high local taxes. In addition, um, you know, for not just individuals but businesses, um, and also very aggressive auditors. Um, those are the those are the states where we see a lot of um, you know audits ending in in some type of settlement um, because they they just. Um, it's difficult to, to get them to move on. 
Um, southern states like North Carolina has the lowest tax rate in the country at only 2.5%. Um, however, some of these states also have a franchise tax. Um, certain states um, offer tax incentives for hiring and investment as well. The key thing there is before you make any plans to set up in a particular state or a city, you would want to um, go to the local officials and have them make you an offer, right? If you've already signed a lease or you know start some hiring or do something there, they already have you there. So they don't have an incentive to get you to um, you know, invest in that community. So you want to um, you know, start that process early and um, you know, entertain a few different locations. Um, the main takeaway here, again, you know, many states and cities, they operate as completely separate countries. Um, and one of, this is uh, state and local issues are one of the big things that we see as exposure for companies um, in the event of an exit, a sale or an IPO. Um, you need to have a very good handle on where you're doing business. And this is um, primarily under two principles that are both referred to as as nexus. So there have been a lot of changes in the state uh, laws over the past couple years and the way the states tax companies. Um, there's physical nexus, which is just like it sounds, where a company has desks and people working um, or inventory. But there's also a newer concept called economic nexus. And more and more states have adopted this economic nexus as another way of measuring the tax liability you have in their state and local jurisdiction. Um, and then sales tax, you know, again, very different than than that. Um, that is, um, you know, not only do you have to look at nexus and where you, you might be doing business, but then also what you're selling, what service and goods, because certain things are, are taxable versus tax exempt. And you may even have to collect exemption certificates from, from customers. So again, you know, just another thing to get in, in front of. Um, and then employment taxes. I know we've talked a lot about, you know, entity level uh, income tax matters here, but there's a host of things to consider when coming into the US um, and hiring employees. We have employer and employee related taxes. Uh, individuals and their employers can create nexus, um, permanent establishment issues. Um, so companies will want to be mindful of properly registering for and paying payroll taxes. Most companies use some type of payroll service. Um, but you know, you also want to think about whether you have employees or what may, may be considered contractors, um, which also has different type of year end reporting. So hopefully I didn't scare everyone away. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tara. I mean, you've given some fantastic tips um, there and, and advice that of, of issues that people need to, to think about. Um, You've, you've talked a bit about tax and, and well quite a bit about tax and the sort of pitfalls are there any particular tax incentives um for you know uk businesses should be mindful of which they they should th be thinking about in terms of their expansion or business activity in the us that could actually help them mm -hmm. yeah so uh, uh, opportunities certainly um you know i know it was mentioned earlier not just from a tax perspective but um the us is you know really uh, can be considered a gateway for expansion into the rest of the Americas. Um, for example, um, a lot of you know our companies that are doing business here in the U United States, um, Canada and Mexico, Latin America follow soon after. Um, you have the access to the U.S. market, U.S. capital, as well as skilled labor. Um, you know, also U.S. is consistently viewed favorably for ease of doing business, despite all the tax matters that I just talked about. Um, but backed by an, an environment that offers federal, state, and local tax incentives. Um, typically, our, those are going to be related to hiring, um, you know, jobs, uh, also um, making capital investments. Um, some tax credits include those for qualifying research and development. Um, there's also a lot of industry-related tax credits uh, for technology, um, startup companies, um, you know, there's a whole host of other industry specific. I know certain companies I have that are in, um, you know, the liquor distilling business. I mean, we even have tax credits for distilling spirits, um, you know, or certain uh, fuel fuel credits. So a lot of different tax credits. 
Um, at the moment, there's also a very competitive corporate tax rate at 21%, you know, with many of the local jurisdictions down as well. I mentioned North Carolina is only 2.5%. Um, there are also a number of provisions available to accelerate uh, deductions. I know the UK has this as well for tax depreciation, um, you know, to write off expenditures um, sooner to incentivize capital improvements. Um, there's also an incentive for US companies with qualifying sales to countries um, outside the US to have those profits taxed at a lower rate um, under what's called the foreign derived intangible income benefit. Um, that's one of the things on the, the current administrat administration's list to possibly um, to change that, but you know, for the time being, it's still available and we have a number of clients that are benefiting from that. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious of time and we have got just a little bit more than five minutes left. Um, we have got a couple of questions. Um, let me just see what I think we can deal with in the time available. Um, one of the questions is in relation to the UK's um, proposed ascension to the um, Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, try saying that in one breath, um, and how that might conflict or actually complement um, the proposed US-UK bilateral trade agreement. John, I think that might be one for you and a bit of your perspective. Are you happy to take it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so look, look, I think the biggest concern that I would have and the biggest concern that I'd relay to members or, or invested parties who are concerned about CPTPP is, is not so much how it might affect the UK's relationship with the US and the UK's uh, prospects to negotiate a bilateral trade agreement with the US as much as it will be how they're going to how it's going to impact the UK's ability to negotiate bilateral trade deals with Canada and Mexico. And and the, the key for, for for them there will be well, what is the what is the UK going to demand Canada and Mexico give them access to? And how could that complicate the relationship between Canada, Mexico, and the US? So certainly there is a there a nexus to the US there. Um, but but I but I think it, it is a really interesting question because I mean, the UK, it, very rightly so, is, is getting involved in the negotiations of, for a lot of trade deals. And a lot of these trade deals can be really useful for them. The question, of course, is not is there capacity to do this, but um, what's the priority and why? So I think, you know, should, should we be negotiating these bilateral trade deals before we start negotiating a comprehensive trade deals? Um, uh, you know, it was it was brought up previously by Anne Marie. It's very important not to forget that the focus on the UK EU relationship is incredibly important. Shouldn't be done at the expense of of a of a, of a deal with the US. Well, you know, nor should negotiations around CPTPP be done at the expense of anything that might happen to the bilateral relationship with Canada, the United States, or Mexico. So, um, I think there are pretty big, significant challenges. Um, that probably we we haven't really jumped on yet, um, but but again, um, very rightly so that the UK should be looking to to I think be a part of that trade block, because long term, I think the US will probably regret having pulled out of TPPP TPP at the beginning of the Trump administration. Thanks, thank you. Um, one here which I'm gonna um bring in Emmanuel and I think this is perfect for you relative to the, the work which British American business has been doing in relation to the tra opening up of the transatlantic travel corridor um, which is so essential to that trading relationship between the the US and the UK. Have you got any insights Emmanuel? <laughs> another another tough tough one tough one here um, because there's almost no inf official information, which I think we all appreciate, and um, we only read the newspapers and see headlines here and there. But um, in order to answer your question, let me tell you what, what I know, what we know, and hopefully that um, offers us a path forward. G7, G7 summit in June, um, big moment because the Prime Minister and the President met, discussed the issue for the first time bilaterally, and set up a task force on travel 
um, consisting of officials on both sides of the Atlantic. Extremely important point because the US for the first time has acknowledged the topic as a topic because the US has indeed, while the UK still lets US travelers in, the US has indeed still the travel ban in place um, um, unless you have uh, a green card or are a US citizen. Um, the task force, I think, look, looks at currently two, currently looks at two things: variance in infection rates um, in both both UK and the US and across the world, um, and then the logistics behind tests and vaccine passports. Until two weeks ago, I would have said we are still in a very tough spot given the uh, increase of the Delta variant in the UK rates going up and um, consisting persisting question, questions around the logistics: how to, for example, bring your um, a little piece of paper that you get from the NHS or from the US counterparts in, in, onto your phone so you can use it um, at the airport to board a plane. Today, however, I would say we're in a different spot. Um, I think it is, despite the situation in the UK, UK good news that the UK is going to reopen on, the, on July 19th. We know this is already the case pretty much in the US where life has returned more or less to, no, to normal. I would argue that the decision by the German Chancellor um, this week to uh, lift the quarantine requirement for British travellers is a good sign because the German Chancellor has been very worried um, about the situation in the UK and therefore imposed quite harsh restrictions on the UK and now she has herself lifted it and I think other European countries will follow suit. Um, at the same time, that's not great news, but we now have the Delta variant in, in across Europe and in the US, so it's not necessarily that you have to contain it just in one place. And from what I learned this week is that um, the industry has done a significant progress in establishing um, uh, structures that allow for vaccine passports to be indeed something that um, travelers can use. Saying all that, I would dare the prediction that, that um, we should be able to travel again by September. Now, I've made many predictions and I was always proven wrong, but um, if, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that we will still have a closed corridor if actually the economies themselves have reopened um, to a full extent. Um, I think in an ideal scenario, we hear something this month, um, but realistically, I think a good chunk of destinations in the US will be open again in September. So if if I were someone in need to travel, um, I would certainly feel that I would book a ticket, um, always worth checking whether there's flexibility involved that you can push the ticket should something happen. And I know that the majority of airlines have now offered that. So um, that would be my prediction as, as of now. Um, fingers crossed. Um, it's been maybe last point. It's been a miracle uh, that we are still in as good of a spot as we are. Um, the cor corridor has now been closed for 15 months. Um, one of the most important travel corridors in the world pretty much come to a standstill. Unbelievable that we are still in as good, in quotes, of a good spot as we are. Um, you would have otherwise imagined things fall totally apart. Luckily they haven't, but obviously it's time to see our loved ones and it's time to see our businesses and, and customers. So I hope that is a little bit of an answer. Thank you so much for the question. Thanks, Manuel. I hope your prediction is right. Um, I'd certainly be looking forward to that if we could start going in September. Um, we are on our time. Um, just a couple of um, minutes to to close off. Um, I was making a, a note of some of the key themes as we were going along and recurring uh, things that I wrote down was where do you need to be? Consider where you need to be when you're looking at setting up or expanding into the US. Record keeping came up a number of times. Opportunities, green growth, um, that was touched on universally, uh, manufacturing, in infrastructure, professional services, fintech, financial, lots of opportunity around that. Tara talked about ESG and that is something which we are seeing both sides of the Atlantic that is high, high on the corporate agenda, not just corporate agenda, but also the agenda for investors when they're looking uh, to make their choices about who to invest in. Um, some real optimism there, um, which is a is a great way to to end this session. Um, fabulous insights from our panel. Thank you again to them. Um, you've brought alive a really brilliant discussion. Um, thank you, and I hope all of you still on the call have have, have enjoyed listening to it. 
Um, I'm just going to point you to our website, um, owenmitchell.com. It's got a huge array of resources on it in terms of our upcoming events, our market insights, the powerhouse report, which I mentioned at the very beginning, which has got further detail on those sort of FDI trends that we're seeing, um, for example, in the US and then how that's overlaid from a sector perspective. Um, you'll have got the contact details of the panel members. Um, so we as a team are available if you've got further questions or if you want to explore it, opportunities or just, you know, bounce some ideas off us, please, please do get in touch. Um, if you can complete the feedback which was emailed earlier, um, then we would be very grateful. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you to our panel. Have a great evening and come on England.